one that is the foundation, really, of the gospel teaching, the New Testament revelation. And Paul got it while he was out there in the desert. And that's what he goes on to explain. He says, I'm not just preaching something that I heard other people preach. I went into the desert and I got this by revelation from God. In verse uh, 13, he says, For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion among many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace... Well, the word grace is used a bunch in this book and in this chapter already. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. In 15 days, Paul couldn't have got all of these questions and all of the things that he was teaching revealed unto him. It was three years after his conversion, after he had already been in the desert. That's where he got his revelation was directly from God. And it says in verse uh, 19, But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed and they glorified God in me. And so all of this is saying, the whole purpose of this first chapter is to say, I, I marvel that you are so soon removed from this good news unto this bad news. It's a different gospel. It's not the same. It's a perversion of the truth. And he says, I'm so absolutely confident that what I've preached to you is the truth, that if anybody preaches anything else, let him be accursed. And then he goes through these things to show you how he received his gospel directly from God. This wasn't something he was taught by man. He knows it came from God. And that's the whole point that he's making is showing you that this is something that he would stake his life on. And brothers, the gospel... The quote-unquote gospel that's being preached in America today is not the same gospel that the Apostle Paul preached. Now, there are good churches. We've got good churches represented right here. There's some really godly people, and there are some pastors doing it, but they're really in a minority. And you need to be picky. You need to pick and choose. You need to be careful about where you go and what you support. I am not against church. I am for church. But I'm for the real church, not the religious church. And then in chapter 2, look at this. He says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took with me Titus also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. The emphasis here is on the word compelled. He took Timothy, which was his closest associate, and he did circumcise him because of all of the Jews. And he knew that the Jews would be offended. So he went ahead and performed this rite of circumcision on him. But when it came to Barnabas, uh, I mean, excuse me, Titus, he said we didn't compel him. Titus didn't want to be circumcised. He didn't want to become a Jew. And so Paul didn't compel him. And he brought Titus with him to the Jerusalem council. This is written in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And he showed him as a trophy of grace. And this man was just oozing the grace of God, the love of God. His life was changed. He had all of the fruit of a Christian in his life. And Paul used him as a proof that you don't have to be circumcised. You do not have to perform these Jewish rituals and rites and stuff to be accepted with God. And like I was pointing out last night, it's not just circumcision, but you could take the same thing today with a person that hadn't been water baptized, that hadn't done this. It's not that you shouldn't do these things. It's that that is not what saves you. It is your faith in the Lord. You could take a person that hasn't got their hair cut, that hasn't put on their three-piece suit yet, that hasn't changed their lifestyle, they're still wearing their do-rag, or somebody as bad as Arthur that's got an earring. <laughs> and they still got the love of God in them. 
Is it possible to be a Christian and wear an earring if you're a man? Well, right here's proof. You see the goodness of God and Arthur and the love of God, and yet he's he's got lace on his underwear too. He wants to. How would I know? I. But see, this is what Paul was using Titus for. He showed Titus, and here was this guy that was just filled with the love and the power of God, and he hadn't conformed to all of the Jewish rituals. And look at this. Look at this. It says, uh, in verse 3, it says, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of... Here's the reason he didn't circumcise Titus. That because of false brethren unawares brought in, that means secretly who came in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. You know what this is talking about? The Jews actually sent people to Paul to spy on his converts, specifically Titus, to see if he was circumcised. You know, let me just point this out. This should be, this should be obvious. But you can't just look at a person and tell if they're circumcised or not. (laughs) If they were spying to see if they were circumcised, you know what was happening? They were in the toilets. They were peeking under the stalls. They were watching these guys go to the bathroom to find out if they were circumcised. Here they are, supposedly the holy people who are peeping toms in the name of the Lord. This is the way that legalists always are. Legalists can be meaner, more vicious, more vile, more ungodly than the people who haven't cut their hair yet. And they do things in the name of the Lord to hurt people and criticize them. It's just amazing. The same thing was going on 2,000 years ago. People were spying on them to see if all of the converts were circumcised. You know, one of the reasons I believe God gave the covenant of circumcision is because it's supposed to be private. You don't go around saying, look at me, I'm circumcised. (laughs) Hopefully you don't. I would say some things, but you know, we've got women on the internet watching this, but so I'll refrain myself. But anyway, it was, I believe the reason God used circumcision is because it was something between you and God. Who really knew whether you were circumcised or not? It goes back to this friendship that Arthur was talking about. Relationship, intimacy with God. God, this was something between you and God, which was intimate, personal. It's not the kind of thing you flaunt and show people your circumcision. You can't go out and brag and portray your circumcision. And yet, so much in religion today, we are sitting here flaunting and talking about, I fast twice in the week, I pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin. You know what? You are supposed to do things. You are supposed to seek God, but you aren't supposed to be bragging about all of that. All of those things come as a result of relationship with God, not a way to relationship with God. I am not teaching that you should go out and just start drinking and doping and doing whatever because there's consequences to it. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 6, I was mentioning this earlier where Paul said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. And then in Romans chapter 6, he gives two reasons. I'm paraphrasing the whole chapter of Romans 6. The first reason is, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in there? You know, if you're truly born again, God changes you on the inside. And you desire to live for God. Now, if you're under the law, you do a poor job of it because the Bible actually says that the law strengthens sin. The law makes sin come alive on the inside of you. So if you're having somebody preach to you about you can't do this and God's angry and God's bitter, that hinders what God wants to do in your life. It makes of Christ of none effect once you start basing what God does in your life on your performance. And so you may not be living a very holy life, but if you are truly born again, you desire to do it. 
It says in uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. And then verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Boy, there's a great message in that that goes right along with grace. When you see Him as He is, good, kind, loving, forgiving, grace, you will be like Him. If you don't see Him as He truly is, you won't be like Him. And that's the problem. But then verse 3 says, And every man, not some men, but every man that has this hope in Him purifies himself even as He is pure. If you are truly born again, You are trying to live for God. You have a desire to live for God. Again, you may be failing in it because religion will actually make sin dominate you. It says in Romans chapter 6, I believe it's verse 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. But if you are under the law and not under grace, sin will have dominion over you. And this is precisely the reason so many people are failing is because they are under this performance-based mentality. They fail. They get condemned. And then they feel like I'm a hypocrite if I try and do it. And so they just go out and live in sin. But if you are truly born again, you have a desire to live for God. And so the first point that Paul makes in Romans chapter 6, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, it's not your nature to live in sin. If you are truly born again, your nature has been changed and everything within you wants to live for God. There are some of you that before you got born again, you did all kinds of things. After you get born again, you may still do some of those things. But you know what? You no longer enjoy it. You're condemned. You feel bad about it. There may be some of you that still smoke after you get born again. But you know what? Now you want to quit. You want to do something different. You may not have succeeded, but your heart's changed. You want to change. You may have been into pornography. You may still do some pornography. If you're a guy in our society today, you can't watch the Super Bowl without seeing pornography. You can't do anything without. I mean, it's all around. And you may still struggle with it, but if you're truly born again... You don't want to do it. You would like to be free from it. And it's this law and this condemnation that's keeping you in bondage. And on and on we could go with the examples. So he says the first thing, the reason that you don't live in sin is because don't you understand that you're dead to sin. You're a new person. And then he gives you a second reason in verse 16, Romans 6, 16. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death are of obedience unto righteousness. The second reason a Christian lives holy is not to earn God's favor or to get God pleased with you. God has just given His love to you by grace. It's not based on your performance. And when you accept Jesus, man, He loves you and He's your friend. And He wants to have a relationship with you. But if you go out and live in sin, you just throw your life open to the devil. Satan cannot just come and devour you. The scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that your enemy, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. He cannot devour every person. If it was just up to Satan, if he could just do anything he wanted to, every person in here would be sick, dying, your marriages would... I mean, every person, not just one or two or a few, every one of us would be totally destroyed. Just like Arthur was using that verse, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And whether you call it religion or the devil, they're the same thing. And he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. If it was only up to him, every one of us would be destroyed. But here's a great truth. The devil cannot do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. Some of you don't like that. We like to say, oh, the devil made me do it and I just can't help it. And that's a lie. Even the man who is demon-possessed with a legion of demons, which a legion, a Roman legion, was 6,000 soldiers. And so we assume that he had 6,000 demons in him. And yet this man ran and fell at the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. 
He might not have been able to get totally free, but even with 6,000 demons, he could still run and throw himself at the feet of Jesus. Those demons, I guarantee you, the demons weren't into that. He could still come towards God. He could still do this. Satan can't stop you. Satan never made you do anything. He tempts you, and you have to consent and cooperate. And this is a little bit of an aside, but this is one of the reasons that we do consent with the devil is because we think that God is at arm's length and God is angry at us because we haven't done what we should. And so we just don't draw on the power of God. Not that we doubt that He exists, but how would God ever use His power on me? And so we just throw up our hands and give up. After all, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I'm not an old sinner saved by grace. I was an old sinner, but I got saved by grace. And now I'm the righteousness of God. God loves me. And I can draw on His power and I can overcome sin. And so you need to recognize that if you go live in sin, you are giving Him consent. Cooperation. You know, I've got a very, very good friend. A lady that I love. And this lady worked for me. She's been a friend of mine for a long, long time. Anyway, she's dying of cancer right now and in the last stages. And she smokes like a smokestack. I mean, she smoked two, three packs of cigarettes every day. When she worked for me, she smoked. I didn't reject her because she smoked. God didn't reject her. Amen. I loved her. She's a good friend. She's a neighbor. I love her, but you know what? She's dying. And I I actually talked to her and she says it's kind of hard for me to pray and ask God to heal me when I brought this on myself and God's convicted me and I've tried to quit. She's lied about it and told people that she quit when she didn't. And you know what? She brought it on herself and she's now dying from cancer. Now, does it have to be that way? I believe that you can repent and appropriate it, but her conscience is so defiled right now that she just can't believe. And you know what? God loves her. God's not mad at her. She's not going to go to hell because she smokes. She'll smell like she's been there, but she hadn't. You don't go to hell because you smoke, but you're just stupid to smoke. You're stupid to smoke. But God loves you, stupid. There's some of you in here that smoke. And you know, it's funny, but people that smoke think nobody knows. You could walk in that door and I could tell. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, and I can smell you coming from a block away, and yet you got gum in your mouth and think nobody knows. You don't have to hide it. I'm not mad at you. You can smoke if you want to, but you're just opening up a door to the devil. You're allowing sickness and disease to come in, and I guarantee it's just stupid. So there's reasons to quit living in sin and doing things, not just because God's going to reject you. God isn't going to reject you regardless of what you do. But man, Satan is going to have inroad into your life. We put warnings on cigarette packs that this will take, you know, that this is hazardous to your health. The average cigarette smoker loses seven years off of their life. Did you know that the average homosexual, this is off of the gay and lesbian uh, website. This is their statistic. They are doing it in a, they're portraying this in a way to try and make you feel sorry for them. But boy, it makes a great point. The average homosexual lives 20 to 25 years less than a heterosexual male. We put a warning on cigarettes because it takes seven years off of your life. Homosexuality takes 20 years, at least three times as much off of your life. And yet people are politically correct and afraid to say anything lest somebody be offended. God loves you if you're homosexual. You're just stupid. What part of (laughs) sex do you not understand? Amen. It's just stupid. But God loves you, stupid. God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Praise God. So anyway, Paul is just going through and doing all of these things, and he's defending the gospel. And man, he allowed people to persecute him, to beat him, to do all of this. But when people came in privately to sneak and see if his converts were circumcised. He wouldn't give place to that for a minute. And man, he drove them out of there. 
Man, you've got to be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he told Timothy to do. And that's what, that's what this whole school is based on. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, My son, be strong in the grace. And the things that you have heard among me, among many faithful witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. And that's what we're in the process of doing. I tell you, brothers, we need to stand fast in the liberty that Christ has given us. And your union with Christ and your love and your friendship with Jesus will so bless you and so fulfill you that you'll give up everything else. You'll give up pornography, your dope, your cigarettes, your booze. Whatever it is that's got you in bondage, man, none of it compares to Jesus. You fall in love with Jesus and you'll fall out of love with all of this other stuff. Amen? And because it's motivated by love, it's no effort. Some of you struggle to love your mate. What you're doing, you're struggling to act like you love your mate. But if you really fall in love with them, If you really love them, it's not a struggle to sit down and communicate with them and to do things. Amen? You really fall in love with God, it won't be hard to do the right things. God loves you. And I'm telling you that there are guys right here in this room who you know that God exists. You don't doubt His power. That's the reason that you came to this thing. But the way you're trying to draw on God's power and get Him to change you is all wrong. You're trying to barter, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. I'll serve you. I'll do these things. It's all based on your performance. And that's the very reason that you aren't experiencing the life of God. And you need to get beyond that and just receive it as a gift. Whatever it is that you need from God, if you need healing, if you need deliverance, if you need a purpose in life, if you need to be forgiven of all kinds of things that you're condemned over, You just need to receive it as a gift right now and let God give it to you. Receive right standing, righteousness, no condemnation with God, not based on your performance, but just as a gift through Jesus that He bore all of your sins, took all of your punishment. Isn't that awesome? I tell you, if you could make this mental change, everything else would work. Faith is just a result of right thinking. If you have the wrong belief system, your beliefs will be wrong. And we have been taught wrong that God loves us based on when we're lovely. And the only thing wrong with that is we just aren't very lovely. Not very often. And we need to get to where we accept God's love because He is love, not because you are lovely. Isn't that great? Father, I pray this for all my brothers in here, all of those watching by the Internet. Father, we just thank you that you love us and we refuse to go unto another gospel. We refuse to move away from the fact that Jesus paid it all and that we are accepted with you because you gave up your son for us. Father, we stand in that. For any person in here that has had it perverted and that has been working under the deception that we have to be worthy and good enough for your power and love and mercy to work in our life. I just take these truths and release it towards them and believe that this truth is setting them free. We believe that guilt and condemnation, hatred for themselves, the anger that's on the inside of people is gone right now as the love of God comes in, that that perfect love cast out fear, Cast out all of this condemnation. Father, we just receive your goodness and your mercy, not based on anything that we've done, but based all upon what Jesus did for us. We receive it. And Father, I thank you that you people are walking free from condemnation, that we are walking in the goodness and the blessings of God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we receive this. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Awesome. Well, I tell you, I hope you're receiving.
There's some awesome things being spoken, and if you could receive this, it'd totally change your life. Uh, we've got lunch back here. Remember, we got a bowling tournament. What time are the special uh, meetings? 1.30 is when Jim Ertle down here is going to be ministering on what? Family? A Father's Blessing. If you haven't read his book, it's really good. I wrote the foreword to it. I read it. It's an awesome book. And then also Barry Bennett is going to be ministering. Both of them are ministering at 1.30. Is that right? Oh, they're going to minister one after another? All right, so Barry will be up first and then Jim. And uh, anyway, we'll be back tonight at what time? Is that for the meal? The dinner starts at 5. The meeting starts at 7. Amen. So you're blessed. Tell somebody that you're righteous and you can be dismissed. Don't they?